Good morning. I'm Andrew Powell from the um, Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm here today with Dr. Jennifer Guderman, who is Vice President of Medical and Clinical Affairs at Aberdell Pharmaceuticals. Thank you for your time, Jennifer, and it's great, great to be with you. Um, tell us um, a little bit about, about what you do at, at, at Aberdell. Absolutely. Good morning, Andrew. I'm thrilled to be here. I joined Avidel in December of 2020 in this role, heading up medical and clinical affairs. And in this capacity, I'm responsible for ensuring that we're publishing our data related to our clinical trial. Uh, we have several peer-reviewed publications which are out and available. We also have had a very strong presence at various medical conferences in terms of posters and presentations. And then in the capacity of clinical, I'm responsible for overseeing an open label study that we currently have underway. We call that study RESTORE, and it's for adults with narcolepsy studying our once at bedtime sodium oxybate that is under review at the FDA for the treatment of uh, adults with narcolepsy. So how did um, Avidel get into the area of uh, narcolepsy, obviously, and, and, and other disorders of, of excessive daytime sleepiness? I love sharing our origin story. So our CEO, Greg Divis, likes to refer to us as a 30-year startup. And what he means by that is we have a long heritage in drug delivery technology. More than 10 years ago, the company decided to apply that drug delivery technology to medications that we thought could fulfill important unmet needs. And at that time, a team member spoke up about the fact that he was living with narcolepsy. And from his viewpoint, the area where there was the biggest unmet need to apply our proprietary drug delivery technology was to sodium oxybate. He shared with the organization the fact that sodium oxybate has only been available as an immediate release formulation. And as you and your listeners know, this requires patients to take the medication at bedtime and then awaken two and a half to four hours later to take that second dose. Because of our heritage with drug delivery technology, we've been able to succeed where this has been challenging for other organizations. What drew me to the company was really two primary facts. First, I had worked with Greg Divis, our CEO, in the past, and I know his commitment to patients. When we talk about being patient-centric and viewing everything that we do through the lens of the patient, that's not just lip service. That is what we do every single day. I had also been following the clinical development program for our investigational form of sodium oxybate, which we call FT218, since about 2014. And being in St. Louis myself, where our US uh, company is headquartered, I was certainly cheering on this organization and thrilled when I saw the positive uh, output of our pivotal clinical trial. And the more and more I learned about those suffering with excessive daytime sleepiness, the more I thought that it was time for me to make a change and really try to focus my energies and efforts on advancing care in this area. So how do you view the um, area of excessive daytime sleepiness? There, there, there's obviously a, a, an established narcolepsy label, if you like, not in a clinical sense, but, uh, but you know, there's, a, there's a population that, that has that diagnosis. And there are also many others who suffer from excessive daytime sleepiness for, for, for various reasons. How do you see that, um, that, that community? So it's, it's interesting that you ask that question. Right now, there's a healthy debate that's occurring within the medical community as to whether narcolepsy type 1, narcolepsy type 2, and idiopathic hypersomnia, or IH, are viewed as separate disease entities as they currently are, or whether the patient community would be better served by looking at these more along a continuum. So certainly what they all share in common is excessive daytime sleepiness. And I feel that for anyone who doesn't have familiarity with this particular therapeutic area, that that phrase excessive daytime sleepiness 
does not do justice to what these individuals deal with. Obviously, as you well know, this is a sleepiness that's pathologic, that greatly interferes with one's ability to thrive in professional and personal relationships. There's a lot that we view in common among those individuals that have hypersomnolence. Many share the unfortunate history of being dismissed in the healthcare system, receiving misdiagnoses, a very long journey oftentimes until they can see a sleep medicine specialist who can appropriately diagnose them and find a way to manage the excessive daytime sleepiness. So there certainly are a lot of commonalities among this community. One of the things we really pride ourselves in at Avidel is listening directly to the patient voice. And one of the ways that we achieve that is inviting people to company meetings to talk about their experiences. So far, we've heard uh, from individuals living with narcolepsy. We would welcome the opportunity to hear from people living with IH as well. And I'm always struck by the fact that these disorders of hypersomnolence can affect absolutely anyone. We really make it a point to ensure that we're hearing from different ages, different races and ethnicities, different lifestyle backgrounds, so that we are looking at the community as a whole, but not losing sight of individual patients, because at the end of the day, that is what is so critical to remember, is there is there are a lot of differences among these individuals who have central disorders of hypersomnolence, and we want to be able to best serve them all, regardless of who they are. And, and what do you believe that um, both from your perspective and also from the, from the perspective of, of the foundation as a patient association, what do you believe that we can be doing better to empower our patient base and to involve them in both um, the research and development work that's going on, as well as their individual um, prognoses and, and, and their interactions with their, with their healthcare providers? I love this question so much. One of the things that struck me when I joined Avidal is this is a therapeutic area where patients are naturally their own advocates. They have had to be because of the long journey to appropriate diagnosis and treatment. So they've had to be resilient in making sure that they see the correct healthcare professional. Carrying that advocacy through beyond diagnosis remains really important. And I think one key area for effective advocacy is education. That's a place where I absolutely commend the work that you're doing, Andrew, with the Hypersomnia Foundation, as well as other patient advocacy groups. Education is so critical and is a first step to really ensuring that the best support is provided to this community. We also think that to be fully empowered, we need to make sure that information is accessible no matter what one's background is. And one of the areas that I'm really excited that we have done this is by publishing our first plain language summary. So plain language summaries are exactly what they sound like. They are intended to take complex scientific information and translate it to reach a wide audience uh, of people who may not necessarily have a medical or a scientific background. And the first plain language summary that we have published is in a journal called Future Cardiology. And what this article is about is whether the 20 years worth of data of sodium oxidate being available has been linked to any sort of heart concerns. And what these authors concluded is that for most patients, they don't need to change their sodium oxidate based upon concerns with sodium. Of course, there's a small subgroup of people who shouldn't take in additional sodium, heart failure, kidney failure, and everyone should always speak with their own personal doctor about any sort of medication changes that they're considering. But this was a wonderful process. I've been through the academic, more traditional peer review process. In this case, we had four patient peer reviewers, and it was every bit as rigorous as that more traditional academic peer review. The ultimate output is an infographic style where there's figures and graphics and short 
bulleted information to really make it something that one can download quickly. We believe this is going to be important not only for patients and their families, but also for healthcare providers who are looking to access information quickly um, it, given their busy schedules. What would you say to members of that community that are perhaps considering getting involved in clinical trials or perhaps just asking themselves what can they do to help in a process where we all have to acknowledge that there's much more we don't know than what we do know? So for anyone who's able to participate in a clinical study, we consider them to be medical heroes. They are helping to advance the status quo and ultimately, hopefully, bring new options available to the community. So that would be one first uh, place where one could participate in terms of advancement. It's also important to recognize that people who are living with these diseases have a voice and have a voice that matters. FDA will host something called the voice of the patient, and the agency wants to understand for various disorders and diseases, what are the unmet needs that can help to guide drug development so that the FDA and the pharmaceutical industry can work together to close gaps that exist and bring needed medications to market. Now, there hasn't been a voice of the patient yet for IH. There was a voice of the patient that was held for narcolepsy back in 2013. In the FDA's report, they talk about this being one of the most well-attended and really active listening sessions that they had in these types of voice of the patient. And it's very clear in reading the reports that patients are greatly impacted by EDS. And that was about 10 years ago. So we've seen new medications coming to market. Hopefully we'll continue to see more, but there has yet to be a voice of the patient for IH. And we know that there are gaps in knowledge with IH and certainly a need to have more options. And so perhaps, Andrew, the Hypersomnia Foundation could work with the FDA and see if having a voice of the patient might be possible because I think we could all learn so much from it.